Thank you, thank you. So, uh, breaking historical ciphertexts with modern means. And uh, my name is Ilanka. I am a game developer and a, a crypto authority and a book author. My website is ilanka.com and... Hello, I'm Klaus Schmee. I'm a German computer scientist, so crypto specialist, and I'm interested in the history of cryptography. And uh, together with Ilanka, We've written a couple books, such as this one, Code Breaking, A Practical Guide. So, uh, introducing this, there are many, many thousands of old ciphertexts. Some have been broken and some have not. And the question is, can they be broken with modern means? So, here's an example of one. This is an encrypted text by Emperor Ferdinand III from the 17th century and here is one from North America this is also from the 17th century here is the oldest encrypted thing we know about uh, this is from 1300 BC it's encrypted cuneiform uh, someone was uh, encrypting the, the recipe for a dye Okay, so we are talking about mm, cryptanalysis today, and I'm sure that at least some of you are familiar with cryptanalysis, and maybe you, you even have some expertise in the field of breaking modern algorithms uh, such as RSA or AES or DES and things like that. But cryptanalysis of modern algorithms is completely different from what we are covering today because today uh, we are talking about classical ciphers. So let's look at some of the differences. Uh, for example, mm, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, what? what mm, okay, well, if you look at um, modern cryptanalysis, uh, usually the algorithm is known, the goal is to determine the key, uh, we are dealing with sophisticated ciphers, uh, the plain text is known or can even be chosen, uh, we have an infinite amount of ciphertext and the ciphertext can be easily read. Well, all this uh, happens when you are dealing with modern cryptanalysis, but Today we are talking about the classical case and here everything is different. Uh, usually the algorithm is not known and uh, the goal is not to determine the key but uh, the plain text and so on. So we have a completely different situation or to summarize this uh, table, modern cryptanalysis and historical code breaking are two very different things. So when we're talking about uh, cryptanalysis or cryptanalysis of old ciphers, let's start with the most simple case, the monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Um, monoalphabetic substitution uh, simply means that you replace every letter of the alphabet uh, with something else. Uh, we, uh, so we have a stable table like you can see here. And the most simple case is that you not even have an alphabet change. So every letter of the alphabet is replaced with another letter of the alphabet. And this is how the encryption works. There's also the slightly more complicated case when the alphabet changes. So again, every letter of the alphabet is replaced with a symbol. But in this case, the symbol might be something that is not an ordinary letter, not an ordinary number, or can be even something you have never seen before. But it's still some kind of symbol or some kind of glyph. And uh, from a code break, uh, sorry, I think I always click on the wrong button. I, I think it should work. Uh, from a code breaker's view, uh, there's no big difference between these two cases because, of course, you can always replace the symbols you don't know with a symbol you know, and this doesn't change the encryption as such. Okay, here we have a Freemason document from the 19th century. In this case, we have no alphabet change because as you see here these are all ordinary letters so it's a monoalphabetic substitution without alphabet change 
On the next slide, we see another Freemasons document also from the 19th century, but this, uh, this time we have an alphabet change because as you see here, we have all these strange symbols. Uh, it's a so-called Freemason cipher and these Freemason cipher letters look different from the letters we know. Uh, but as I said, uh, it's a substitution in both cases. So from a code breaker's view, it's not much of a difference. And now the question is, how can we break such a simple monoalphabetic substitution cipher? Uh, most of you certainly know how it works. Or of course, there are several methods, but the most obvious one is frequency analysis. So if you know the language that was used, mm, you know the letter frequencies. For example, in English, as you can see here, the E is the most uh, frequent letter. It has a frequency of almost 13%, per cent, followed by the E, T, A, O, and so on. And this helps when we want to break a message. I can show you an example here. Uh, this is um, encrypted text from the 17th century, the so-called Winthrop cryptogram. Mm, it was created by an alchemist, so uh, it certainly makes sense to break it because maybe it will tell us how to make gold. But um, before that, we need to know how to break it. Well, let's start with uh, frequency analysis and then we see that uh, this letter that looks a bit, little bit like an 8 is the most frequent one, so could be an E. The second most frequent one is uh, this one that looks a little bit like a J and so on. And if we use the frequencies and do some trial and error, we can pretty soon solve this mystery. And it turns out that uh, this letter that looks like an 8 is an E, and the second most frequent one is in this case an I. This is not always the case, so as I said, it requires some trial and error. But um, within uh, 15 minutes or so, it's usually po possible to break such a system without computer support. And now let's look uh, what is written in here. Well, it's uh, an alchemical text, uh, take excellently well purified base salt, dissolve or malt it, and so on. Well, uh, usually uh, the, the content of such a message is, is not really interesting for the code breaker. So the, the code breaker is interested in how the encryption works and not in what is encryption, in, in what is encrypted. And uh, I'm pretty sure that it will, won't help us to produce gold. Okay, now, uh, as I mentioned, something like this can be done uh, by hand, but um, of course today it makes sense to use a computer program for this purpose. And in fact, a frequency analysis uh, with a computer is uh, not very difficult because there are quite a few programs around. For example, Multitech by Christian Baumann from Austria or Rump, the Rumpkin cipher tools by Tyler Aikins. All this is available for free on the internet. And uh, just like CryptoCrack, uh, created by an anonymous uh, developer group. So in, in my view, the best tool for cryptanalysis and uh, for cryptanalysis of old ciphers is this one here, Cryptool. It's an open source software created in Germany. Uh, it has been around for 25 years. And uh, meanwhile, it's a very good tool with a lot of crypto and cryptanalysis uh, functions. And I use it a lot when I want to uh, do a, a code breaking work. Uh, Cryptool was developed by a team of over 15, 50 people. Some of these are very active in the scene, so I, I know them well. And as I said, it's a tool I use quite often. So let's now. Uh, look at another example of a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. This one is uh, the so-called bearing gold cryptogram because uh, uh, a British man named Sabine bearing gold in the 19th century created this, uh, uh, wrote a book and in this book um, a cipher text is contained and this cipher text is usually referred to as the bearing gold cryptogram. This is how it looks like. Uh, it's pretty short, only two lines. And uh, now uh, let's try to break it. Well, uh, first of all, you see that we have an alphabet change here because uh, all these are symbols or numbers and not ordinary letters. 
So the first step is usually to create a transcript. A transcript simply means we replace every symbol from the ciphertext with a uh, uh, letter from the ordinary alphabet. How this is done uh, doesn't matter, it just needs to be consistent. For example, uh, you can see here there are two fours in, uh, in this picture and both of them should be replaced by the same letter, of course, otherwise you get in trouble if you do text statistics. But in this case, we use a C to replace the four. Then we go on. There are two H's, again, uh, no, sorry, there are two plus signs. Again, we should use the same symbol to replace these, uh, the H in this case, and so on. And uh, what we have now is uh, the so-called transcript. So it's the same encrypted text, but now instead of an alphabet change, we have ordinary letters. Now we could do a frequency analysis, but this probably won't help because the text is too short. So we need to do, we need to apply, apply another method. And today this is no problem anymore because today in the age of computers, we have a very good method named hill climbing. Well said. So <clears throat> now that we've converted it into letters, which is something that our brain can more easily munch, uh, we do the system where we, uh, we're going to generate a random key. And that generates a substitution table. And then we're going to decrypt it, even though it's going to come out somewhat random. And then we're going to rate the correctness. Now I'll come back to that later. Now we're going to create a new key that is slightly changed. Again, random, but we're going to keep the copy of the old key. Now we're going to decrypt with the new key. And again, we're going to rate the correctness. And again, I'll come back to that. And we're going to see, has the correctness increased? If so, then we're going to keep the new key and get rid of the old key. If not, then we restore the old key. And then we rep repeat the steps. And so what we're going to get here is we're going to climb a hill where we're steadily looking for better correctness. And often, when we get to the top, the best correctness, we will have the solution. Not always. Sometimes we get to something called a, a local maximum where it looks like we've gotten to the top but we haven't gotten to the top top and and so this is called a local maximum and there are ways of dealing with this there is a system that's called simulated annealing annealing is a term for metallurgy where they will heat metal and then they'll kind of heat it and then cool it and what they're trying to do is affect the uh, the properties of the metal. And with simulated annealing, you have a program where you're adjusting what's called the heat, and maybe you're going to have a, a fast or a heavy heat, or maybe you're going to make it cooler. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get it off of that local maximum and all the way to the real top. And we could talk a lot longer on simulated annealing, but kind of outside of the scope of this. So correctness, how are we rating the correctness? Well, in this particular case, we're going to check on the letter frequencies and we're going to look at the candidate. Remember we said we had that random candidate and we're going to look at what kind of letters are in it. And if it has frequent letters in English that are frequent in the candidate, then that would be a high score. Whereas if rare letters are rare in the candidate, that's also a high score, right? But if we're getting the plain text candidate and we're getting the rare letters are being common and the common letters are being rare, then that would be a low score, okay? So looking at the bearing gold cryptogram, Let's say, okay, this is one step, and so we're going to have our substitution table, our plain text candidate, the result, that uh, score, and the step. 
we're only looking at successful steps in this case. All right, and then we go to the next step and so forth. All right. So here at the uh, penultimate step, we have a plain text candidate of a murd in the hand is worth two in the mush, which our brain probably, you know, a human brain kind of jumps on that, but the computer hasn't quite gotten it, and then it'll get to the next step, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, which is the correct plain text for this particular cryptogram. So many other monoalphabetic substitutions and more complex substitutions as well have been solved this way. All right, now we're gonna go to a different system. Yes, now let's look at the so-called turning grill encryption. Mm, I think most of you have seen this before. Uh, these are original turning grills uh, from the 19th or even the 18th century. Mm, I can show on this slide how this kind of encryption works. First of all, we need a plain text to be or not to be. And because this one is too short, I have added three X's for padding. And now we need to write this plain text into this stencil, starting with the first four, then we turn the stencil by 90 degrees, and then the next four letters are inserted and yes, well, this, I think this is a well-known kind of encryption, and it's a, a transposition encryption. That means nothing is replaced, only the order of the letters is changed. And now, um, what you can see here is uh, the plain, uh, sorry, the cipher text. Uh, I hope you can see it even from the rows behind. Well, this kind of encryption was quite popular, especially in the 19th century or even before. Here you see a few examples from the Netherlands or from England, from Italy. And of course, uh, well, now the question is, can an encryption of this kind be broken? And uh, the answer is yes, there are manual methods to break such an encryption. So uh, already in the 19th century, it was possible to break this kind of encryption, but it's very laborious. And so now the question is, can we use a computer-based method for this task? And the answer is yes, we can use hill climbing again. Well, uh, it's clear that hill climbing can be used, but it's not really clear how well this works, or at least it wasn't clear until 2017, or at least I didn't find anything in the literature. So what I did is I created a challenge and published it on my blog. So I took um, a text, encrypted it with, um, with, uh, with a turning grill and a pretty large one, 20 by 20, and I published it on my website and I uh, told people to solve it and so I was quite excited to know how long this would last and the, the answer is um, it was pretty fast. So Armin Kraus, a, a German a code-breaker, only needed a few hours to break this encryption with hill climbing. So apparently if you have the right tools it's quite easy to break it and of course if you're as good a code-breaker as Armin. Uh, the, uh, the algorithm here is exactly the same as the one Ilonka explained. The only difference is uh, we need a different scoring function because uh, letter frequencies are not helpful here because, as I said, we are dealing with a transposition cipher. The, the, the order of the letter changes, but nothing else. So the frequency of the letters stays the same. So we need something else. But uh, what we can use is we can use letter pairs or so-called digraphs because uh, the digraphs change, of course, and uh, the digraphs are characteristic of, a, uh, of every language. For example, in the English language, something like th or en or er is quite, uh, quite frequent, while rare letter uh, pairs are things like qr or cx or pf. So if you have a frequent letter pair, it gets a high score, otherwise a low score. And this is exactly how Armin Kraus, uh, this German code breaker, uh, broke this uh, 
uh, turning grill challenge, as I said, uh, took him only a few hours, including doing all the programming. And this is the solution. Well, the solution or the plain text is not relevant here because it was a challenge. And the, the bottom line here is that even messages encrypted with a very large turning grill can be broken with hill climbing today. So it's certainly not a good idea to use uh, this um, message for uh, this, this method for messages that should be secure. And there are better methods available today anyway. OK, so much about um, turning grill encryption. The next chapter is covered by Ilonka again. Hey, nomenclators. So uh, also, I wanted to say I appreciate that everyone is in here because I know how hot it is in here, and especially with uh, the masks. And I see the sweat, and it's like everyone's kind of melting out of their chairs. Uh, so thank you for sticking with this. Um, so nomenclators. Uh, Klaus and I actually had uh, quite the argument in uh, for our book on whether to include nomenclators. Uh, uh, he convinced me. I have religion now. So um, what's a nomenclator? It's, it's sort of a monoalphabetic substitution that also includes complete words. They're often proper names. And the term nomenclator is, comes from the person who would be, say, at a, an event who would call out the name of people as they were arriving. And uh, it's been around a long time. So here is an example, not an actual nomenclator. Say we're going to encrypt the phrase, we'll come from London to Berlin, and we're going to use this table on the left-hand side. Some of the words we're just going to uh, encrypt letter by letter. And sometimes, for example, for the word from, we're just going to put two digits, because that's from the table. right? And then London, same thing. Two, we're going to do letter by letter. And Berlin, just two digits. Now here's an actual nomenclator table from the 17th century, and there's several different parts of it. Parts of it are just letters, and you can see there's actually three different choices for each letter in this table. So it's also got what's called a homophonic option. And there's also these places where you could take each letter and followed by each of the possible vowels, and then that could be one of a couple different numbers. And then you have the actual names in this table, which are there, and then you've got three digits. So how do you solve a nomenclator message? Well, the simplest method is you find the table. However, that's not always possible. So um, there's a uh, different ways of doing it. You can uh, derive the table from other messages maybe that have been solved. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the Zodiac Killer. The, uh, this is a, a serial killer in, in Northern California, and he had sent uh, encrypted messages to the press and saying, if you can solve these, uh, it'll give you information about who I am. And uh, one of the messages was solved very quickly by a husband and wife team, Donald and Betty Harden. Uh, he had had interested in ciphers, but she was more, uh, I think, the, the intuitive of the two. And, and between the two of them, they, they solved one of the messages called the, uh, the Z408. We call that because there was 408 symbols in it. And, and then there were other messages that uh, were sent as well. And you can see here from the 408 that it was also what we call homophonic, because each uh, letter could potentially have multiple different symbols. Then there was the Z340, and this became one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. And it remained unsolved for over 50 years, and then it was finally solved by a three-man team using modern means, computers, including hill climbing. And then they published their solution in December 2020. And it was really interesting because they were on different continents, one from the United States, one from Australia, and one from Belgium. Uh, Jarl van Eyck, I actually just met him a, a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, Klaus and I refer to this as one of the greatest successes in the history of non-military cryptanalysis. Um, so I were, I'm going to talk very briefly about how the, the uh, 340 came apart. If you take the first 20 letters of it, and then you come down diagonally, sort of like a, a knight move in chess, right? And, uh, and then you make a, a substitution table, again, the homophonic table. And it, the plain text in this is, I hope you are having <coughs> a lot. And I'm not going to read you the whole plain text, because this uh, 
this guy w- was not all there, obviously, but they did clearly solve the message. And then that leaves two messages, the Z32 and the Z13, which are not solved yet. Some people say they will never be solved because they're too short. Others say, well, maybe it's going to include some combination of systems from the others. <clears throat> so, and some say that, you know, maybe the Z13, the potential solution is Alfred E. Newman, who, if you're a fan of Mad Magazine, you'll know that character. So, let's go over to a few other unsolved ciphertexts. Yes, so um, this is this is the most um, or the, the best known unsolved ciphertext at all. It's the so-called Voynich manuscript. Uh, you might have heard of it. It's an encrypted book from the 15th century. It's uh, handwritten and uh, hand drawn, and uh, it has never been solved. So it's not possible to read it. Uh, the, it's written in a script that is otherwise unknown, and uh, the, there are many pictures in it, and the pictures can usually can't be identified. So there are a lot of plants in it, and it's not really clear uh, what, what what kind of plants uh, this is supposed to depict. And this is clearly uh, one, or may- maybe in my view, it's uh, the most important uh, unsolved crypt- uh, crypto mystery in the world, but there are others, and uh, there's especially one uh, Ilonka is an expert in. Give me a microphone. So so my favorite is one that's called uh, Cryptos. This is at the center of CIA headquarters, Langley, Virginia, and um, I, I've been uh, kind of toying with this one for, for decades at this point, and uh, some people say that this is one of the most famous <laughs> unsolved codes in the world. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go into a, a great deal on it, but if you look at the uh, the plates that are on it, we have the ciphers that we call one, two, three, and four, um, and then there's four, which is still unsolved, and it's 97 characters there at the very bottom. Now, the artist has actually given us some clues towards solving part four. Uh, this is Jim Sanborn, and uh, so in 2010, he said, okay, well, at this location, at the 64th character, we have the word, plain text, Berlin, and then uh, he gave us the word right after it, this was four years later, uh, the word clock, and then uh, in January 2020, he gave us the word northeast, and then the pandemic hit, and so he kind of wanted to stir things up, and so he gave us another clue, which is the word east. So here we have a sizable chunk of the plain text from K4, and we still don't know what the whole thing says. So there's a lot of theories on K4. All right, and let's see. Then we've got another thing that we've been working on. This is an encrypted postcard from 1873. This was sent to us by a man who found it in his family uh, documents. He said this was from his great-great-grandfather, uh, George Furlong. Uh, he was the owner of a, of a soccer, of a, of a football team, uh, a club, a football club in Luton, and it was a postcard that he sent to his sister. So we figure that it, it can't be that difficult, and we have these things that are underlined, and, but it's, again, it's something that we've never been able to solve. And there are many, many more unsolved ciphertexts out there. So a lot of computer systems have been uh, used on these, but they remain unsolved, so research is ongoing. Uh, so conclusion, very briefly here, um, breaking historical ciphertext is an active field of research. Uh, it's different from cryptanalysis of, of modern methods, uh, because like we don't have an infinite amount of ciphertext that we can work with and then try and figure out the algorithm. Um, but the hottest technique that's out there right now is definitely hill climbing. And uh, there are still many old ciphertexts left to solve. So, any questions? Yeah, how about, um, all right, he's going to hand the microphone right there. I saw a hand go up. Yeah, I was going to ask if hill climbing uh, uh-huh. works, if like multiple rounds of encryption have occurred. Uh, okay, so you're talking about super encryption where you've got, uh, will hill climbing work? Uh, it, it can. What have you heard? Yes. Well, uh, something like this happens, for example, uh, when one tries to break Enigma messages. 
so if, if you if we're talking about an enigma it has a plug board and then it has the rotors and uh, doing hill climbing on the whole system usually doesn't work because uh, the, there are too many variants but uh, something you can do is uh, do two hill climbing steps so first of all do hill climbing for uh, the, um, the rotors and then the second time for the plug board and uh, this works uh, the difficulty in here is the, the scoring function so it's uh, if you have two different encryption steps you need to uh, tell if a text is good or bad based on an encrypted text and uh, this is really difficult but uh, depending on the system you're working on uh, it works or at least there have been examples uh, where this worked quite well uh, another way that super encryption uh, and hill climbing might go together is you might have something that doesn't have a typical uh, graph, a frequency analysis graph for a, a language. And so you're going to go through hill climbing and you're trying to find something that matches that graph where you've got uh, a peak and lows instead of everything just kind of even. Yeah, good question. More questions? Are the techniques still effective uh, if the languages have changed over time? So, like frequency analysis on Old English, for example. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, yeah, a little louder, please. Are the techniques such as frequency analysis still effective for la uh, old languages? You can take the mask off. Just, just yeah, okay. Are the techniques still uh, effective, such as frequency analysis on Old English, for example? Yeah. Uh, yeah, doing frequency now. I mean, it helps if you know which language that you're dealing with. Like if you know you're dealing with English or French or German or Latin. Um, and, and so sometimes, again, you've got that uh, kind of trial and error. You're looking for which kind of a pattern. What about languages that you don't know what the plain text uh, frequency? Huh. Languages where you don't know the frequency analysis. That would be really hard. <laughs> you have to make one yourself. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're building it as you go. Hmm. Out of curiosity, from, from, from my perspective, uh, yeah. if you want to learn more about this, you know, how do you get the interest into uh, doing this kind of work? You know, any suggestions on where to ask, uh, where, where to start on this? Any YouTube videos, any websites, any blogs? Or, you know, how do you start? And there's a book up front there by Elonka and Klaus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a way into cryptanalysis. Any more questions? Uh, Simon Singh also wrote a wonderful book called The Code Book. Um, there is a website called Mystery Twister uh, where people will upload uh, either uh, classical ciphers or ciphers they've created on their own. And you can look and see each one how many people have solved it. So if you want something easy, go to something that's got thousands of solves. And if you want a challenge, you want zero solves or one solve. Yeah, mystery yeah. twister, yeah. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Do you know of any initiatives using uh, generative AI to uh, help on solving some of those? OK. Has AI been able to help solve these large language uh, models? In my opinion, no. Uh, when uh, uh, when uh, OpenAI came out and ChatGPT, and I'm like, oh, OK, part four of Cryptos. I know it's 97 letters. I know we've got Berlin at the 64th character. And what I rapidly found out is that ChatGPT cannot count. And people say, oh, that's not true. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it, it is true. I said, just give me a sentence that's 97 letters long. It can't do it. You ask it five times, you'll get five different sentences of different lengths. So um, not yet, I, I think, is my answer so far. Uh, Maybe I can add something. Uh, the answer is completely correct. Not yet. But I know of research projects that try to change this. Well, at least in, uh, in theory, it is very well possible to uh, do all this uh, frequency analysis and all these other statistical tests with artificial intelligence. I guess uh, this will work well in a couple of years. 
because uh, that's usually the first step. You perform frequency analysis and a few other uh, statistical tests, and then you draw conclusions. So it could be a substitution cipher, or it could be a transposition cipher. And this is certainly work uh, that can be done by artificial intelligence. So does any of these techniques you've been mentioning work on one-time pad ciphers? Um, well, if a one-time pad is used properly, uh, no method at all helps because it can't be broken. It's 100% secure. Mm, usually, uh, one-time pads have been broken before if the, um, uh, the random sequence that is used is not really random, for example, if it's repeated. And I guess uh, that things like these can be done or can be solved with the computer. Mm, it's probably uh, difficult to do it with um, uh, with uh, the methods we introduce, such as uh, simulated annealing or hill climbing, because you don't really know what you're searching for. So that's basically the problem. Maybe AI could help here because it could analyze a stream and then draw conclusions. Mm, hill climbing probably not would be my guess. Or, or perhaps maybe just the XKCD strip of the uh, uh, the famous XKCD strip, where you have uh, two people saying one pe person say, says to the other that blasted they are using a 4096 bits uh, key we screwed, and then on on the next picture it says well we'll just use this five dollar wrench and punch okay. somebody in the head, and then we we'll yes. get then we will get the one time pass. That's uh, also a, a kind of cryptanalysis, <laughs> not <laughs> not the one we cover in our talk. <laughs> Oh, you, oh, yeah, you don't have anything about physical violence in your book. Um, yes, may, maybe we should include that in the next <laughs> edition. It's, it's called rubber hose cryptography. Yeah, yeah. Or, inter or just interrogation techniques. They are very efficient sometimes. Any more questions? None. Okay, yeah. Uh, do you know if any of your methods to do a cryptanalysis have been used to actually understand some of the languages, so all languages that are not necessarily encrypted, but uh, but we don't know the answer. It's sort of like helping like Maya hieroglyphics that have been solved already, but some of the others. Well, uh, I have to admit that I don't know much about old languages. Uh, I know that there are certain relations between uh, cryptanalysis and uh, trying to read old languages, but I don't know anything about it. I, I'm a computer scientist, not a linguist, so I'm afraid uh, I can't say much about this. Uh, the main thing is that with modern means, we have the computers that can do the large databases and sharing this information around multiple continents, and, and that's definitely helpful. Um, in terms of uh, hill climbing, uh, I haven't heard of anything, but um, for example, with uh, nomenclator tables, often we have an encrypted message, so someone's gone into an archive, they have found encrypted message, we don't know what system it is, we don't know it's a nomenclator or what, and, and so then the next steps are, well, what do we do? Well, we look at other messages near it, right? Okay, so those are nomenclators. Maybe this is a nomenclator. Does this one use the tables that these other ones did? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, there was a, a big discovery uh, recently about messages uh, written by Mary, Queen of Scots, where uh, the table they didn't have, but they derived it from the messages that they had. OK, well, thank you, Lonka and Klaus, for coming along to Pastor's Con. Yeah. And thank you to you. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, there are a couple of books up here for those interested. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, you can ask about them. Uh -huh. And we'll be back at 5 o'clock with Dwayne, Dwayne McDaniel doing the talk li Long Live, Short Live Credentials, Autoritating Secrets at Scale. So see yeah. you back at 5. Thank and you. Anyone that's going to DEF CON will have two talks there as well. Okay.